Administration of H.R. 527, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to amend the Helium Act to complete the privatization of the Federal Helium Reserve in a competitive market fashion that ensures stability in the helium markets while protecting the interests of American taxpayers and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, each will control 30 minutes. House will come to order. <laughs> Members will please take their conversations off the House floor. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support today of H.R. Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. House will come to order. Members, please take their conversations off the House floor. Chair now recognize the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I say, I rise in support of H.R. 527. This bill is necessary to protect our economy from an impending helium shortage and to inject free market principles into our federal helium program. The Federal Helium Reserve was first created after World War I. When we imagine a world where blimps would be the future of air travel and vital to our national security, Mr. Chairman, the House is not our. House will come to order. <laughs> Members, please take their conversations off the House floor. The gentleman from Washington may continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as I said, the Federal Helium Reserve was first created after World War I. When we imagine a world where blimps would be the future of air travel and vital to our national security efforts. Although this effort took a different course, it didn't stop the federal government from spending money on this program and stockpiling helium continuously through the 1980s. By the 1990s, it became clear that the reserve had a declining usefulness and had racked up $1.3 billion in debt. In response, Congress in 1996 passed legislation to implement reforms to the program and require the sale and privatization of the reserve by 2015 or when the debt was paid off, whichever came first. However, since its original decision to close the reserve, both the demand and uses of helium have dramatically changed. This has created a situation where the reserve's debt will be paid off sooner than expected, nearly two years earlier in October of this year. But while the debt will have been paid off, there will still be helium in the reserve. By law, then, the current federal helium program will end and the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, will no longer have the authority to sell the remaining 11 billion cubic feet of helium. It's important to note, too, Mr. Chairman, that the reserve came, contains half of our U.S. domestic supply and 30 percent of the world's helium supply. So if Congress fails to act before October, 
we will artificially drop the helium supply and cause a global helium shortage that will cost jobs and severely disrupt our economy. Now, despite what many think, helium is not just used for party balloons. It is essential to our 21st century economy. Without helium, we wouldn't have life-saving MRI machines. We wouldn't have computer chips, fiber optic cables, or other devices used for our defense needs. The bill before us today is truly a bipartisan plan, and I am pleased to have worked with the lead Democrat on the Natural Resources Committee, Mr. Markey from Massachusetts, as well as our other colleagues on the committee, Mr. Flores of Texas and Mr. Holt of New Jersey. First, this bill would implement a new operating system for the Federal Helium Reserve over the next decade that would include semi-annual auctions. This will ensure that we prevent a helium shortage and that the reserve stays open until nearly all of the helium supply is sold. And second, it will build on the reforms made in 1996 and inject more free market principles into the sales process to get a better and fairer return for American taxpayers. Over the last decade, the federal government has been selling helium from the reserve significantly below market prices. As you can see from this chart, <clears throat> and this is based on BLM data, the new demands for helium have caused the market price to rise much higher than the federal government's pricing formula and much faster than BLM's ability to track market prices. So as a result, this has cost taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. This has been confirmed by reports and testimony from both the Government Accountability Office, GAO, and the Department of Interior Inspector General. The big gap is right here. This is what we're selling it for, and this is what the market price is. In addition, the current program restricts sales to only a few companies through an allotment system that is essentially an oligarchy for federal helium. Nearly 100% of our helium supply is being put into the hands of four refiners that directly benefit from the low federal pricing formula while other competitors are locked out. The current cheap price of helium gives an unfair market advantage to these handful of companies. So implementing semi-annual helium auctions will inject much needed competition into the program and help establish a fair market price for helium. According to the CBO, this bill will bring in over $340 million to the Treasury over the next 10 years. The bill also includes important reforms to increase transparency and to prevent supply disruptions. Now, Mr. Chairman, over 20 groups representing the end users of refined petroleum, and these are high-tech manufacturers of semiconductors, aerospace technologies, medical devices, chemicals, fiber optics, and scientific research all have called for passage of this legislation. Although this bill enjoys broad bipartisan support, I do want to take a moment to directly address some concerns that have been ra raised throughout this legislative process. First, doing nothing is not an option. While I recognize that many people don't believe that the federal government should be in the helium business, and I would agree, we must recognize the realities of our current situation. Helium is too essential to our economy to essentially cut off the valve at the reserve. We need this bill to protect our economy from severe disruptions and provide additional time for new development of alternative domestic helium resources so that our country and economy is prepared for when the reserve does close. However, this bill will make sure that we are building on the reforms in the 1996 Act and that we are managing and selling the helium in a more responsible manner. Second, maintaining the status quo is not an option. Under conditions in, new, in the current law, the entire program comes to an end this October. So simply Authorizing the continuation of the current program does nothing to address the current issues with the federal pricing formula and the need to implement free market reforms. We cannot keep selling helium to a handful of companies and instead we need an open helium market that encourages more bidders, more competition, and more accurate pricing in order to get the best return for the taxpayers. So this is what we need then, Mr. Chairman, is more, no more lucrative handouts, 
No more government picking winners. What we need is good old American competition. And finally, this bill will do absolutely nothing to interfere with private business contracts and will not create instability within the helium market. With or without this legislation, the existing helium program and existing contracts all will end in October of this year. This bill violates no contracts because none will exist when certain conditions in current law expire, which we think will be this October. This is why Congress must act before October to establish a new helium program to finalize the sell-off of the helium in the reserve. The bill will protect our economy from a harmful helium shortage and implemented much needed reforms to update the federal helium program so it better reflects the uses and demands for helium in the year of 2013. Mr. Chairman, this is a good bill. It's a bipartisan bill. I'm glad I worked, uh, glad I had support uh, working with my colleagues across the aisle on the committee. I, it's a good bill and I urge passage of this legislation and with that I reserve my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt, is recognized. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise in support of H.R. 527, and I begin by commending and thanking Chairman Hastings uh, for his uh, bipartisan leadership, his outstanding leadership on this legislation uh, and other things before the committee. Uh, this bill was drafted in close cooperation with the Democratic minority, and I thank uh, uh, the, the chairman of the committee. He worked with Ranking Member Markey and me and Representative Flores, and uh, we've put together, I think, a solid piece of legislation. The legislation is an example of how we can work together. Um, I wish it were moving faster on the floor today and tomorrow, um, but it is a cooperative undertaking. Uh, as the chairman said, helium is critical for magnetic resonance imaging, MRI machines, for NASA rocket operation, for high-tech manufacturing, and, and for all sorts of scientific research. For many of these applications, there is no replacement for helium with its truly unique uh, properties. Far-sighted legislators established a federal stockpile many decades ago. That was, uh, that was good, and as important uses of helium were recognized over the decades, uh, we can uh, be thankful that the stockpile existed. Um, the frenzy of privatization under the Gingrich era in Congress has now made this legislation necessary. Uh, our nation's federal helium reserve supplies nearly half of the helium used in the United States. And if Congress fails to pass this legislation, um, by the end of the current fiscal year, the Interior Department's authority to continue operating the reserve will expire. If this is allowed to happen, nearly half of America's helium supply would be cut off overnight, creating truly a crisis in healthcare, research, in uh, electronic manufacturing, and many other areas. That's the immediate problem that this legislation would solve. But there's a second, um, potentially more severe problem uh, to be addressed. At the current withdrawal rates, we have only five to seven years of helium available from the reserve. Reviews by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Government Accountability Office, and the Interior Department Inspector General's Office uh, have all concluded that we are not selling the nation's helium at market prices. Sit, uh, since federal helium comprises such an enormous percentage of the global supply, the price set by the Interior Department controls as required under the guidelines established some years back, uh, the global price of helium is artificially low. The current system uh, isn't just a bad deal for taxpayers, it has also, also distorted the global helium market. And if we continue to avoid a solution, as some have ad advocated, we could find ourselves facing even more severe helium shortages and price spikes 
um, when the Federal Reserve is largely exhausted a few years from now and when there may be insufficient alternative supplies to turn to. That's why we must reform our nation's helium policy, put the market-based signals in place that will help uh, provide an incentive to bring new supplies online, and failure to enact reforms of the helium program, such as those contained in this legislation, could mean increased reliance on insecure and irregular helium supplies from Russia, Algeria, Qatar, and other foreign sources. It could mean higher prices for American industry and for researchers. There have already been interruptions in supply. National labs have tes testified before our committee uh, that helium delivers, deliveries necessary for their research have already been subject to interruptions. The bipartisan legislation before us today would address both of these impending crises. H.R. 527 would extend the life of the Federal Helium Reserve past the end of this year and ensure a fair return to taxpayers on this federally owned resource. It would generate more than $300 million for American taxpayers as estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. The bill will increase competition, transparency, and participation in helium markets, which will help shift commercial helium reliance from the reserve to private sources. The principles of this bill are consistent with the recommendations made by the Na National Academy of Sciences uh, in 2010 to improve the helium program by expanding participation and openness in helium markets. It will protect federal users such as NASA and the national labs as well as the scientific community by ensuring that they have priority access to this federally owned resource in the short term and exclusive access in the longer term. This bill was created with input from the Department of the Interior, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and many scientific researchers. It has the support of the American Physical Society and many other groups, and many helium users, such as corporations like General Electric, Siemens, Philips, Intel, Applied Materials, Dow Chemical, IBM, Texas Instruments, and many others. It's a product of close work between the majority and the minority members of the committee, and again, I thank the majority for providing that collaboration with us. It's a good bill, provides a workable solution to a real problem. I urge its adoption. I wish we could deal with this problem, with this bill promptly, and all the amendments promptly. We could be done in less than an hour. And then we could turn our attention to other concerns that Americans have, jobs and education and training for workers, a conference committee to reconcile the differences between the House and the Senate budget resolutions, um, removing the thoughtless sequester that the majority imposed on the country, um, affecting air traffic control and food inspections and Head Start slots and medical research and many other things. But instead, uh, we will postpone the consideration of the amendments until tomorrow, I'm sorry to say, and eat up valuable time that we could spend dealing with America's pressing problems. Nevertheless, I look forward to the passage of this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support it. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves, the gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, a valuable member of the Natural Resources Committee. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of H.R. 527, the Responsible Helium Administration and Stewardship Act. H.R. 527 is important legislation for our nation's high-tech, defense, medical, and scientific industries. It will ensure the continued operation of and sales of helium from the Federal Helium Reserve, providing a stable, and secure a supply of a critical material for the next several years. This legislation represents a significant step forward in addressing the concerns associated with the helium supply from the Federal Helium Preserve. This also creates a situation where we have a reliable source of helium that's critical to the strategic interests of this nation. This bill also provides for continued operation of the reserve 
in the sale of helium to private entities, thereby helping to ensure a stable and secure supply of helium in the near term. It provides price transparency through clear reporting requirements for both the Bureau of Land Management and for those who purchase helium. And for many industries throughout the United States, this reliability and transparency is absolutely critical. H.R. 527 is important and is urgently needed to address this nation's helium supply and making sure, too, that we keep in mind the implications it has for both our national and our homeland security. I'd like to applaud Chairman Hastings and Ranking Member Markey for their work on this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Virginia yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Um, I, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Speaker, like a kid at a carnival, I rise in full support of H.R. 527, the Responsible Helium Administration and Stewardship Act of 2013. Mr. Speaker, I'm relieved that, and I'm, and I'm sure that uh, the American people are relieved as well, that Congress is finally going to do something about one of the most pressing issues of the day. That is, uh, we've got to ensure access to helium for all. Surely those harmed by sequestration and those harmed by the Republican failure to appoint budget conferees appreciate the House spending two full legislative days on this most critical issue. The American people certainly understand the fact that 48 hours of this, house, of this House's precious time was necessary to pass such a non-controversial bill. I'm pleased to support this bill, which shows that this Tea Party Congress will make the tough choice to keep children's birthday parties on schedule and give industries that rely on helium the lift that they deserve. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, a world without balloons. How can we make sure that the injustice of there being no helium for comedians to get that high-pitched voice that we all hold near and dear to our hearts. Imagine a world without balloons. Today, the House has chosen to just simply float above it all. And finally, we're going to do something for the American people, and we should all pat ourselves on the back for that. Too often lately, this body has sat deflated, not for a lack of hot air, mind you, but seriously, ladies and gentlemen, unlike a noble element, this House has failed to act on Americans' real concerns. There are serious reasons to support this bill, and, and I do look forward to supporting it. The substance of this bill is not the focus of my sarcasm today, Mr. Speaker. My point is that America would be much better off if this Tea Party Republican Congress brought to the floor issues that mean the most to Americans, like appointing a conference committee to work out a budget with the Senate. Sadly, Republicans are just blowing in the wind and can't seem to tether themselves down to take up such an important task. Uh, 30 if the seconds. If the gentleman needs additional time, I gladly yield 30 no, one seconds. One minute. Uh, one minute. Thank you. The gentleman's recognized for an additional minute. Thank you. Sadly, Republicans are just blowing in the, rent, in the wind and can't seem to tether themselves down to take on such an important task. They float off in different directions, unable to appoint conferees to negotiate with the Senate. Yesterday, despite the gravity of the matter, the Tea Party Republicans couldn't even agree on their own health care bill, which was named 
the Help Sick Americans Now Act. With a title like that, I'm flabbergasted. I'm helium flabbergasted that they could not pass that bill. Yesterday, we spent all day debating that bill, and today, after their failure to pass it, uh, they've decided to, uh, they, they have pretty much made a decision that sick Americans can wait. We need laughing gas because of the inability of the Republican House to deal with the dis difficult issues. Um, it's real sad. We need some laughing gas. The sequestration, uh, which is delay delaying flights, harming our economy. Uh, Fifteen more seconds. I yield the gentleman 15 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for an additional 15 seconds. With sequestration, delaying flights, and harming our economy, our nation needs a little gas. And say what you will, uh, but this is uh, just the best thing that we could do here. So I'd like to float a simple idea. Stop wasting our time. Let's get to the business that is meaningful for Americans. And I support this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask my friend from uh, New Jersey. I have, at this point, no more requests for time. One may be coming, but uh, if he's prepared to close, I'm prepared to close. Uh, we have at least one more speaker I'll reserve besides my, time. my closing. I'll reserve my time, and I may have another speaker come in. I'll reserve my time. The gentleman from Washington Reserves, the gentleman from New Jersey, is recognized. I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, who counts among his constituents uh, many who work in technical industries and laboratories uh, who depend on helium and understand that although there are a lot of um, easy jokes about helium, uh, this is a serious matter. It's a serious matter that we should move along with promptly. The gentleman from New York is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Holt. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Hastings and Representative Markey, Representative Holt, and other members of the Natural Resources Committee for working steadfastly together to bring this important bill to the floor. The Federal Helium Reserve was created, as we know, in 1925, long before today's many uses of helium were envisioned. Now this element has become an essential ingredient to our nation's research, our nation's medical, technology, manufacturing, space, and defense activities. Helium is used in welding and in the manufacturing of fiber optic cable and semiconductors. Medical imaging has become a vital tool in the healthcare system and every MRI requires helium. The list of applications for this element is long and touches many important industries. When the current law passed in 1996, the situation with respect to helium's value and usage was quite different, and there was an expectation that additional private sources of helium would be developed and then, of course, enter the market. For a variety of reasons that has not yet happened, on a sufficient enough scale to ensure a stable supply of helium to meet our national demand for this basic element. The federal government, through the Bureau of Land Management, needs to remain engaged in this market for an additional period of time. The United States Reserve is about 40 percent of the worldwide supply of helium. The many industries and research institutions that rely on helium cannot afford a disruption in its supply. The National Storage Facility is unique, and there are many characteristics of the helium market that are distinctly different from the markets of most commodities. These factors are likely the reasons a more robust private supply of helium has not yet emerged to replace our federal government's role. H.R. 527 provides additional time to phase down the federal government's role in the helium market and to allow a private market to develop. There is no substitute for helium in many of its crucial applications. Passage of this legislation is critical to maintaining high-wage, high-skilled jobs in my district, the 20th Congressional District in New York, throughout New York State for that matter, and in many other states across our great country. It is essential that we work with the Senate to get a law signed this year to provide certainty to helium suppliers and users. I recognize there are some who are uncomfortable with certain aspects of this legislation. It is not a perfect bill, 
and if the expected development of private supplies of helium does not occur, we need to revisit this issue in the future. For the present, though, this bill offers a reasonable compromise that keeps helium flowing onto the market, and that is what we need now. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 527 and maintain a reliable supply of this vital ingredient for the sake of research and industry. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, the chairman of the subcommittee dealing with this issue. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, thank the chairman of the full committee for uh, allowing me to speak. I rise in strong support of H.R. 527, the Responsible Helium Administration and Stewardship Act. Our House Natural Resources Committee passed this bipartisan le legislation by voice vote and I encourage my colleagues in the full house to do the same. The Responsible Helium Administration and Stewardship Act adds free market reforms to the current system. The current system allows a small number of companies to have access to and benefit from the taxpayer resource, which is helium, but it's a good thing to broaden the base of those who are most benefiting from this resource. There is currently some instability in the marketplace for American companies that are the end users of helium. These companies employ thousands of Americans and they rely on a dependable supply of helium for their business every day. The, this includes defense companies, medical companies, manufacturing companies, and a variety of users. Numerous government reports from the Department of Interior Inspector General to the Government Accountability Office to the National Academy of Sciences have all come to the same conclusion. We need to reform the current system. The current system allows a select group of companies to buy a critical federal resource at significantly below market value to the exclusion of other companies. There are historical reasons how this situation developed, but we have to look to the future and what's best for the economy moving forward. As a result, the American people are potentially being denied tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars of additional revenue because this federal taxpayer resource is sometimes being sold at under market values. It should be noted that over 20 organizations and end user companies representing high tech manufacturers of semiconductors, aerospace technologies, life saving medical devices, chemicals, fiber optic and scientific researchers who require helium as an essential part of their daily business who support this bill. H.R. 527 will ensure that these industries employing thousands of Americans and vital to the United States can obtain a reliable and secure source of helium while ensuring American taxpayers that they receive the best possible market value for this taxpayer resource. H.R. 527 will end the current allotment system and add free market components to the BLM helium program. This will increase transparency between companies and the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and ensure that purchasers of helium will have timely access to the pipeline to ensure delivery of the helium that they have purchased. This bill is supported by the ITI and I submit for the record their letter to Congress. I urge your support of this legislation and I yield back. The gentleman's request is covered by General, General Lee. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the comments of the gentleman from Colorado, the chair of the Energy and Minerals Subcommittee. Uh, he again reiterates, he reiterates the uh, the important uses of helium. And I would add that any American patient or doctor who uses MRIs which depend on helium, or any American who uses modern electronics whose manufacture depends on helium, or anyone who uses, who depends on so many other things that, uh, for which helium is essential, should be grateful that Decades ago, far-sighted legislators created the stockpile to preserve helium. We now have before us the need to make sure that helium isn't sold at fire sale prices. 
we need to make sure that we have a reliable supply for these important uses. Uh, we need to make sure that the Interior Department is not forced out of the business prematurely. Um, the Interior Department has expressed support for the approach taken by this legislation. Uh, again, I commend and thank the Chairman for his bipartisan leadership to bring this sensible legislation to the floor. I hope that the other body will act quickly, follow our lead, and pass this legislation so we do not experience supply disruptions and price spikes later this year. Um, I urge passage of this bill, and I yield back uh, any remaining time. The gentleman from New Jersey yields back. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as has been pointed out on both sides, this is a very important piece of legislation. Our, our free economy is made up of a lot of different parts. And it's hard, and as a matter of fact, it's impossible to regulate all of those parts. The market does it a whole lot better. But in this situation, because of past actions of Congress, there was a stockpile of federal helium, and it became more and more valuable, but market prices weren't beaten got for that a valuable commodity. This issue addresses that until the markets can catch up in several years in order to make sure there is a supply of helium. And I'm glad to have worked uh, in a bipartisan way with my colleagues uh, on the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, we'll deal with the uh, amendment process tomorrow. That's why we have a rule. There are several members that wanted to improve uh, from their point of view the, this piece of legislation. Uh, and you can't do that, uh, obviously, on a suspension calendar as, as has been suggested. You have to go through the rule process, and we will do that uh, tomorrow. So in the meantime, Mr. Chairman, uh, I urge, um, uh, I urge uh, adoption of this uh, legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. One yields back. For purposes, the gentleman from Washington. I move this committee do now rise. The question is on the motion to rise. All those in favor will say aye. All those opposed, nay. Charles, the ayes have it, and the committee now does rise. The House will be in order, Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union, having had under consideration H.R. 527, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has under consideration H.R. 527 and has come to no resolution thereon. The chair will entertain one-minute requests. For what pur purpose does the gentleman from Indiana seek recognition? The, the, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kermit Gosnell is a real-life Hannibal Lecter. Gosnell operated an abortion clinic that severed the necks of hundreds of babies and stuffed their bodies into freezers, plastic bags, and cat food tins. Soon a jury in Pennsylvania will decide his fate. Mr. Speaker, the Gosnell case must give us a moment of reflection. Have 40 years of abortion on demand seared our national conscience and given us a false refuge behind euphemisms like choice? More than 3,000 unborn children die in abortion clinics every day in this country. While none of these deaths attract the headlines of the Gosnell case, each loss is a tragedy. Each of these defenseless, defenseless babies are just as innocent as Gosnell's victims, just as human as you and I, and just as precious as our own children. There is no moral distinction between killing a baby five minutes after birth or ending her life five minutes or even five days before delivery. In the coming weeks, more questions will be asked. 
Who referred patients to Gosnell's House of Horrors and what can be learned from these atrocities? Today, we all ought to re-examine our national conscience. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida... The question you have is consent to address the House of Horrors. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every day, over 3,200 children are boarded in this great country, the same country that is called the land of the free and the home of the brave. This isn't just unacceptable. It's a horrific tragedy. And my heart goes out to all the women who feel that abortion is the only option. God made them special and made their children special, too. These children aren't free and will never have the option to be brave. Currently in Philadelphia, Kermit Gosnell, an abortion doctor, is on trial for multiple counts of murder. One count is for a woman who died during an abortion at his clinic. The horrific findings of Mr. Gosnell's clinic serve as just one more devastating wake-up call. As a country, we should work to protect everyone, including women and children. When will we, when will we be old, bold enough to enact serious changes? These children are precious and are truly gifts. We should not use any taxpayer dollars to fund abortion, and I also believe that we should prohibit abortions for unborn babies who are more than 20 weeks old in utero, which is why I recently co-sponsored the District of Columbia Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. For what, person, or for what purpose does the person from New Jersey rise? Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, the Jeffrey Dahmer-like murder trial of an abortion, abortionist named Kermit Gosnell is replete with shocking testimony of beheadings, unfathomable abuse, spinal cord snippings, death in body parts in jars. But how different, really, is Gosnell's house of horrors from the abortions that occur in clinics around the country every single day? Not much. Not much at all. Mr. Speaker, will Americans ever be told the horrifying details as to how and how often Abortionists dismember, decapitate, and chemically poison innocent babies. Last week, reporter Timothy Carney asked participants in a call hosted by the pro-abortion group RH Reality Check, quote, what is the distinction between what Gosnell did and what a late-term abortionist like Leroy Carhart does? Professor Tracy Weiss responded, quote, when a procedure that usually involves collapsing the skull is done, it is usually done when the fetus is still in the uterus, not when the fetus is been, has been delivered, end quote. That's it. It's just a matter of where, in the womb or not, that this violence against children is construed to be okay. Where is the outrage? Over 55 million children, victims, who have been killed by abortion. And where is the, the appalling lack of compassion? Why the empathy deficit for the victims, women and children, especially by our president, President Barack Obama? Women and children deserve better. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas rise? The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, there's been a lot of talk in recent months about a war on women. But those using the term to attack pro-life supporters should look a little closer to home for the real war on women. Abortion proponents would like us to believe that the atrocities being discussed at the murder trial of Philadelphia abortion provider Gosnell are neither standard nor acceptable practice in the abortion industry, but evidence indicates otherwise. The so-called Aid for Women abortion clinic in Kansas City has also been the subject of several investigations into the care provided to women and the cleanliness of the facility, with reports very similar very similar to those coming out of the Gosnell trial. And with abortion providers all up and down the East Coast referring patients to Gosnell's clinic, I find it hard to believe that no one knew of the conditions, the wretched conditions at this clinic. That is where the real war on women and war on children is occurring. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman uh, from Nebraska rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, sometimes it's just so bad that we don't even want to look at it. Sometimes it's just so awful we want to turn our face away. But we can't. 
Shekena Abrams was a 17-year-old when she went to see a doctor named Gosnell. He performed an abortion on her. After, afterwards, she was diagnosed with a grapefruit-sized abscess and a clot near her heart. It took her two years to recover. She was just a child, Mr. Speaker. This Dr. Gosnell waged his own private war on women. And for what? For profit. Now, thankfully, he's on trial, and thankfully, more and more people are learning about this. Maybe, Mr. Speaker, we just don't want to look because it is so awful. Maybe it's challenging our very premises, our very understanding of what this choice for abortion really leads to. But we have to look, and we have to recognize how deeply we are inflicting wounds upon our very selves. Mr. Speaker, women deserve better. Our nation can do better. Why not help young women like Shekinah and let the healing begin? I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, ask the unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I join my colleagues to continue to shine a light on the human rights abuses that are the subject of the Kermit Gosnell trial in Philadelphia. Dr. Gosnell's practice included a procedure he called snipping. This appalling procedure ended the lives of some of the youngest members of the human family. A culture of life needs to reject the philosophy that gives rise to such horror, and no organization that would support the ending of such young lives should receive one dime of federal funding. I thank the speaker, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise to highlight the deeply disturbing case of Dr. Kermit Gosnell, who is currently charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of third-degree murder related to the botched abortions at a Pennsylvania clinic. Former employees have testified that he delivered babies and then killed them by snipping their spinal cords with scissors. <clears throat> one staffer described this procedure as, quote, literally a beheading, unquote. Mr. Speaker, life is precious, and therefore every abortion is a tragedy. But this case exposes the full horror of abortion carried to its logical end. As columnist Kirsten Powers recently wrote, the difference between late-term abortion in the womb and the murder of a newborn infant is simply merely a matter of geography. In response to a nearly total lack of coverage by mainstream media, I and many members who stand uh, today here, uh, including Marsha Blackburn, Steve Scalise, and the whole cadre of folks that are ta speaking today, wrote to the heads of the major TV networks demanding that they cover this and other high-profile abortion controversies. Thankfully, this case has begun to receive the attention it deserves, and Americans are discovering that this is not about pro-choice and it's not about pro-life, but it's about basic human rights. Thank you, and I yield. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does... For what, what purpose does the gentlewoman from New Hampshire rise? I ask the unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week I am introducing common sense legislation to encourage public and private partnerships to help meet the needs of New Hampshire student and businesses. The Workforce Development Investment Act would give tax incentives to firms that partner with educators to improve workforce development and job training for students. Training a highly skilled 21st century workforce is critical for growing our economy, creating jobs, and strengthening the middle class. When we invest in our workforce, more employers will invest in the United States and in the Granite State. Our students will be more competitive in the job market. Our businesses will be more successful in the global economy. Right now, there are companies like W.H. Bagshaw in Nashua, New Hampshire, that are looking to hire but struggling to find workers with the right skills for the job. My bill would help close this skills gap 
by providing incentives for businesses to team up with educators to teach our students the skills they need to compete and succeed. This is a common sense proposal and I urge your support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from uh, Minnesota rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it's difficult for me to even speak about this subject today. I'm a woman who's been privileged to give birth to five children, and I've also taken 23 children into my home as foster children. It's very hard for me to imagine, Mr. Speaker, that a doctor in this country, a doctor who took an oath to do no harm, would in fact kill a woman at his abortion clinic, and he would sever the heads off of four babies that were born alive and potentially others and commit one gruesome act after another and shamelessly the mainstream media has all but gone silent and failed to cover this horrific violence against women. No one, Democrat or Republican, believes in violence against women. We abhor it. But there's nothing that comes close to what's happened in this abortion clinic in Pennsylvania. And the officials in Pennsylvania and the State Department, unfortunately, it appears, willfully ignored this heinous crime. And also it appears that this has been ignored now across our nation. Well, we won't. And I thank God for the men who've stood up here today to stand for women and against violence against women. And I lend my voice and my support to that effort as well. I yield back. Time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Arizona rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, today I introduced a bipartisan piece of legislation to help tackle the substantial backlog of veterans' claims. My bill is called the VA Claims Operations and Records Efficiency Act, or CORE. It directs the Department of Defense to enact an efficient electronic transfer of veterans' records instead of the outdated paperwork process that is currently being used. The average veteran waits more than 250 days for a decision on a claim. About 175 days of that time is the VA waiting for the DOD to send the complete records. In Arizona's District 1, one of my veterans caseworkers is helping several vets who have waited more than two years. This wait time is simply unacceptable. Federal agencies must leave paperwork in the past and adopt efficient electronic approach. I thank my colleague Chairman Kaufman for co-sponsoring this bill. Helping our veterans isn't a partisan issue, it's a national responsibility. Let's end the backlog so we can keep the promises we made to our veterans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentlewoman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? I'd like the Michigan to speak to the House for one minute and revise my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Without objection. I am glad our country is having a conversation about gun violence. It's about the children, we say. I am glad our country is discussing immigration reform. It's about the children, we say. I am glad we are finally having a conversation about our trillion-dollar deficit. It's about the children, we say. Every day this chamber debates and votes on legislation, all in the name of the children, we say. Well, baby A was a child. He had ten fingers and ten toes, and he moved. He moved before those scissors were jabbed in the back of his head, and he moved in reaction to the pain he felt. Baby B had ten fingers and ten toes. He kicked in his mother's womb. His mother was a child herself, scared, frightened, looking for an adult to help her. Mr. Gosnell, Dr. Gosnell, his staff, the health department, and even national pro-choice organizations were in no way concerned with these women, their health or well-being. Instead, these entities either turned a blind eye or they were mo more devoted to a political ideology rather than the sounds of babies drowning in toilets. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.
I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Philadelphia, an abortion clinic murder trial is about to go to the jury next week for the death of four children and one adult. The one adult was killed by an overdose of drugs that she was given during the abortion procedure. The four children represent many children that were delivered completely and then their spinal cord was cut while they were outside the womb. The defense has said those children would have died anyway. They were small. The drugs they had been given would have killed them already. The surgical destruction that happened during the actual abortion procedure would have died. So those children don't matter. They shouldn't count as a murder. They wouldn't have lived anyway. I'm going to ask two questions with that and introduce you to someone. One is, what is the difference in three feet between delivering a child and snapping their spinal cord or killing them in the womb? And the second is, why would we do this to children in the first place? I'd love for you to meet Olivia. She goes to high school with my daughter. She was born in 1906 at one pound, two ounces, just over 20 weeks of delivery. The very same as these children that were killed that day and many days in that Philadelphia abortion clinic. We have got to stand for life. We cannot be a nation that does this to our children. With that, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Without objection. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to raise awareness about the trial that's going on in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Kermit Gosnell is on trial right now for murder of at least four babies who were born alive as the result of a botched abortion, as well as a mother who was murdered during the process of an abortion at the hands of Dr. Gosnell. Now, just a few days ago, more than 70 members of Congress sent a letter to the heads of all the three major networks asking why they're not giving fair coverage to this trial. I think we all recognize if Dr. Gosnell used an AK-47 instead of a scalpel, the media coverage would rival a natural disaster, yet barely a peep comes from the mainstream media because it happened to be an abortion doctor who was actually performing abortions. This is one of those untold stories in our country that we all need to stand up for, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're here today. We're going to continue to stand up for the lives of the unborn and for their rights. Yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak to the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, Today I join my colleagues to express my disgust and anger at the barbaric actions of Dr. Kermit Gosnell. The facts of, these ca of this case are gut-wrenching. As a father, a Catholic, as a health care provider, I believe in protecting the unborn. This case isn't, about, isn't only about upholding the sanctity of life, but it is also about patient care and safety. Further, it shows many in the mainstream media will turn a blind eye to the murder of infants if it suits their political agenda. Regardless of one's abortion position, no one can defend Gosnell's practices, yet his criminal case proceeds without the national outcry for justice that we have heard on other murder cases. Do we value the lives of infants or the health care of mothers who endured such horrific medical care? The lack of oversight allowing Dr. Gosnell to operate under horrific conditions, perform late-term abortions, and murder babies should be scrutinized in the same manner as other serial killers. My hope is our actions today shed light on this case and start a conversation to be sure that this never happens again. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Mr. Speaker, unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise with my colleagues uh, today to uh, ask why the media has not reported on this atrocity that's been going on related to Dr. Gosnell. I rise also as a member of Congress, but also a minister. And I read, a, uh, I read an article just recently on this very issue that really brought to my attention what the problem is, why the media won't report. The article talking about Dr. Gosnell said he regularly and, and illegally delivered live, viable babies in the third trimester of pregnancy, and then murdered these newborns by severing their spinal cords with scissors. He overdosed his patients with dangerous drugs, spread venereal disease among them with infected instruments, perforated their wombs and bowels, and on the, at least two occasions caused their deaths. 
Over the years, many people came to know that something was going on here. But then, Mr. Speaker, it ends by saying, but no one put a stop to it. Until we stand, as citizens of the United States, until ministers in the pulpit stand and speak for life itself God-given, until we return to our foundational principles, the media, our president, no one else will listen to the cries of these innocents. Mr. Speaker, it is time for America to stand in their defense. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I stand today.